Rosanna, it's so good to see you again. Uh, so, so grateful to have you on the show. I was thinking about the first two times I think we met. We've probably been in the same rooms, but the first time we met, you were actually doing a baking demonstration with I Justine on stage at the Streamies. <laughs> And then you pulled out a Streamy Award, I think, out of like whatever you were baking or something like that. And then you handed it to me. And that was incredible because I was just like, I was not expecting that to happen. And it was this really like <laughs> weird experience, but it was amazing. It was so impressive. And then we were just talking about this. We met at Lily's Diwali party. Lily's our mutual friend, Lily Singh. Uh, and, and you were just telling me about how that was your first Diwali. My first one, and it was wonderful. I had the time of my life. I didn't know we were dancing until the AM, <laughs> and I was kind of joking that this year I'm going to carb load, <laughs> kind of like an athlete. I'm going to carb load, and I'm going to come into Diwali <laughs> with all the love and light, and I'm going to dance my little butt off until the AM, until the sun comes up. So did you pick up some Indian dance moves? or uh, I have a lot of dance moves. Okay. wouldn't necessarily call them Indian. <laughs> They're just there. <laughs> Is it but a changing the light bulbs is that is yeah, that what that the light bulbs. Oh, that's a good one <laughs> yeah okay i didn't think about yeah, that actually about a that. professional dancer so. back in my day like two decades ago <laughs> <laughs> not two decades not that long ago maybe i need <laughs> lessons <laughs> I'm sure Lily's amazing too. Lily's, Lily's that, also a good yeah. dancer. Yeah, 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 Lily's also And what dancer. about Jay? You got some moves? No, not so much. <laughs> not so much. Not so much. Maybe, maybe a while ago. Like, <laughs> not so much Bollywood, but, you know. Yeah. I was, I was okay, but not, not anymore. <laughs> Two decades ago, as you said. Uh, Rosanna, uh, you know, the reason why we did this show was we really felt like there's so many incredible creators in the world, so many amazing stories, but often online we only see a snapshot of people's journeys and people's lives. And we only see a headline or we only see a follow account. And we wanted to make this show because we really believe that there are so many young people out there who want to be creators, who look up to creators, who like creators are their idols, but we wanted to tell the story behind the scenes that goes on and the journey that people don't often see, if that makes sense. And we wanted families and young people together to be able to watch these and dissect stories of their favorite creators and understand the challenges and the struggles and the pains as well as the wins that people go through. So uh, I wanted to start off by asking you, you know, you grew up as a self-described nerdy and awkward kid. And I was wondering whether you've ever felt bullied or excluded or what, what did that feel like when you say in your own words, I grew up as a nerdy, awkward kid? I grew up poor. Our family didn't have a lot of money. And so I learned skills and hobbies that were really functional, like sewing, baking, cooking. And the things that I loved doing were also considered really nerdy at the time. I like to play video games, which have now become more mainstream. But growing up, that was something really nerdy to like stay home and play video games versus go out to a big party or something like that. So growing up, I kind of called myself nerdy. Those are the words people use to describe me. So I think when I would hear all those external words, that's what I started to tell myself that I was. I heard that I was nerdy. I heard that I was awkward or weird. It's weird that I knit. It's weird that I sew. It's, you know, weird that I like spending time, so much time with my family. I'm not out with my friends all the time. I'm at home with my mom. Uh, so I kind of got labeled as that and I decided to make it more of an empowering word. So that's when I made the Nerdy Nummies show. I thought all the things that were considered nerdy and I got called nerdy for, like video games and loving sci-fi and fantasy. Um, my dad used to read The Hobbit to me every night growing up. He really got me into those things and my dad uh, loves Star Trek. So I have seen every episode of Star Trek. Um, my favorite is Voyager, and I have watched the entire season through seven times. Um, wow. Janeway, Captain Janeway was like my hero growing up. And for all of those things, people called me nerdy. And then so I started to identify as nerdy. Those are things that I love. And then it grew into being a theater nerd, and it just kept going on from there. So it was 
Um, something that I came to love later, but growing up, you know, kids are cruel in school. They can be really mean. And I mostly got bullied because I was different, but also physically, I'm very short. I'm very petite. And they'll pick at anything that stands out. And my height is something that stands out whether I want it to or not. And so a lot of them would call me like pipsqueak or small fry, but not in an endearing way. It was like, get out of here. And I remember a group of girls when I was in elementary school cornered me in the hallway before a class started and they thought it would be really funny to lock me in their locker. And so they shoved me in there and I got bruises everywhere. I was really trying to fight back, but there was four of them, one of me, um, and I was locked in there for quite some time because people went to class, the bell rang, no one could hear me, no one was walking the hallways. Um, I think a security guard found me after a few hours, but it was like a long time to be in there. Thank goodness they have those ventilation holes wow. like that you can Gosh. breathe. Um, but it was, yeah, that was not cool. It didn't really happen as much in high school because my dad gave me some great advice. He said, you're short, people are gonna try to mess with you, so don't take crap from anyone. And that's something that I applied when I went on to middle school and high school, but I definitely didn't know that in elementary school. And how did you get through those tough times? I remember I, I had school bullies, and every day is a battle just to try to make it until 3 p.m you know, when you're getting picked up or get to go home, how would you deal with that on a day to day? Do you remember? Really just ignoring people, letting the small stuff slide, like just don't even recognize it because it doesn't, don't give it any energy because it doesn't matter. And most of the time when I would ignore people and just kind of deescalate, uh, that would work in most cases. Um, or even starting to use humor as a coping mechanism. Like I someone was like, hey, shorty, and they were saying it as a mean thing. And I said, I really like that. That's actually really cute. I'm going to go by shorty now. So <laughs> by high school, it was a term of endearment, which is what I wanted because I like being small. It's who I was. So in high school, people would say, hey, shorty, but it was a cute thing then. But I remember in middle school, it was that weird transition time where I had to use a lot of humor. I had to use a lot of avoiding people who... It felt like they had stuff going on in their lives that was really negative, and they were kind of taking it out on me like an emotional punching bag, and I was just kind of easy pickings because I'm little, I have a hard time reading, like it's very, I'm the weird kid because we're really poor. I mean, there was just a lot of things to pick at, so I think I was just like an easy target, and I think the people who targeted me had their own emotional issues going on where they felt like they needed to poop on someone or they needed to basically dump on someone. They, they needed an outlet, and they weren't doing it in a healthy way, and they thought doing it to me was you know, their way to deal with. Maybe they had a bad home situation or a bad relationship or they had self-esteem issues. Uh, so most of the time, avoidance, humor. But there was one time I did become physical. Uh, that was one time. And my mom was like, no, she's such like a peaceful hippie. And she's just like, no, 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 use your words. And my dad just said, if anyone ever comes for you, physically puts their hands on you first, you tell them that's a boundary with this. And I was <laughs> like, so my dad and my mom had very different parenting <laughs> styles. Um, and my dad was just a really feisty Irishman. And he was also short. He was the same height as Danny DeVito. So five foot, five one. And he struggled with people making fun of him as a, a male being so short. Um, and he was uh, a college wrestler. He was a little beefcake. And he just always had that attitude where um, you're going to be short. And if anyone ever gives you a hard time, you tell them to eat crap. <laughs> I'll say, I'll say, or poop, eat poop. But yeah, yeah, that was his advice to me. Um, and luckily I only had to get in that situation once that was physical, but it kind of showed the other students and peers that she has boundaries. Yeah. And so 
that actually really helped. When you're talking about how you're trying to have empathy for what others are going through, it reminds me of something that I've actually learned on your podcast and here you say, hurt people hurt people. And yeah. it's something where if someone's broken inside, then they also try to break you. And so keeping that in mind and trying to protect your energy is so important. And I love how you've been able to embody that with your own story. I know there was also a point that you were getting, I don't know if it was bullied, but given a hard time by a teacher as well. Is that right? Because you grew up with dyslexia and there was a teacher that gave you a hard time. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, there was multiple teachers who were not very sensitive to, I think, kids with learning disabilities. I think also there wasn't a lot of information 20, 30 years ago when I was going to school. I think it was difficult for them, but this one was later in life and that one really stuck with me because it was so hard for me to get into college. I had to work my buns off to get to college. And it was, it was just such an achievement. I couldn't even believe that I had gotten into college uh, having a learning disability. It, it was one of the happiest moments of my life. I felt so proud of myself and I was like starting to build self-esteem. And I was like, yes, you did this. You belong here. You're smart. You got this. And it was my first day of class at college. My first professor and my parents raised me to respect my elders. So I really respected my teachers and people of like authority figures. I just gave them that respect. So this was a professor. This wasn't even just a teacher. This was a worldly professor. And I just admired them immediately. And I was in class and we had to do an in-class essay. So I didn't have time to spell check, proofread, go to tutoring, have them go over I had to do it in class and she took all of our papers, she read them out loud and gave critiques on the press releases. It was a communication course and she was giving critiques and she came to mine and said, I don't even know how you got into college. And it was in front of everyone. I was just so, my heart just sank. She said, you have the writing ability of an eighth grader. How did you even get into this school? I didn't even know how to process the words that she was saying to me. I just got overwhelmed with emotion. I got so embarrassed because my professor is telling all my peers that I'm not smart enough to be here. I'm, not, I'm the dumbest kid in the room. And it was one of the worst experiences, I think, that I had. I did leave class to collect myself and later went back privately during her work hours and told her that I have a learning disability, I'm dyslexic. And where I really struggle reading and writing, it, it doesn't come naturally. It takes me more time. It takes me more time to decode and process. Where I struggle in some areas, I'm very strong in others. Uh, and that's why I'm here. And she softened a little and had a little bit more compassion. And I hope that she just remembers that because it's one of those things that I can't ever forget. I don't know if the right word is trauma, but you know when you, something happens and you just remember it forever. Yeah. Yeah. No, it just sounds like you've had so many different moments that would be so difficult as a young person to go through. Obviously, now when we reflect, you know, as we become more mature and older in our lives you can make sense of certain things or you can piece it together. But when you're living it, I think we can both agree that that's how, all of those experiences sound so tough and so disheartening. What did it do at that time to you? Like, what did you turn to if there are kids that are watching this or young adults that are watching this right now that, you know, may have learning disabilities. They may come from uh, certain backgrounds that people are taking, making fun out of at school. Like, what is it that you turn to at those times to kind of keep your own self-esteem and your own confidence? Because I can imagine that when someone ridicules you like that in front of your peers, that's one of the most demoralizing things in the world. I think I would like to just tell everyone that the traditional educational system that's in place is not meant for us. It is not meant for dyslexics. If you are dyslexic, the traditional school system is not made for you. And that is 
normal and school is going to be the most difficult part of your life because every day you're going to be have to doing things that you're not good at over and over and over and over again. But through that, I think it gave me moxie. I think it gave me grit. I think it gave me fire. I think it gave me just this drive the, to not fail. I wanted to find something I'm good at. And if anyone is listening, I we always talk about I feel like the cons of dyslexia, uh, there's there's a lot of them. It, it is difficult, uh, but there's so many pros that I really wish in school they would have touched on that. I don't know what class that would have come up in, but I wish we would have discussed the pros of dyslexia and focused in the areas where dyslexics flourish because dyslexics flourish in about four categories. I watched this amazing TED talk and I'd encourage anyone at home listening or watching to go check it out. It's on YouTube, it's free, it is 15 minutes. Uh, the man giving the TED talk on dyslexia is named Dean and he's an advocate, he's dyslexic and he's done so much for the community and he really explains what dyslexia it is on a neurological level and the areas, career fields like vocations that are such a good match for dyslexics to build self-esteem, to find something that you're good at and you just start loving yourself because you've found something that you're good at. You don't feel like you're dumb or stupid, which is not the case uh, either. Um, I think growing up, one of my teachers was like, you know, Ro has a learning disability, she's dyslexic, so she's a little slow and dumb. And they found that that is not the case. Uh, people who are dyslexic do not lack intelligence. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, a lot of them have average intelligence or much higher. Um, one out of every two NASA rocket scientists are dyslexic. NASA wants the dyslexics because we think in 3D spatial reasoning. That's just how we think. Um, so it's a great fit for astrophysics. It's a great fit for rocket scientists. At MIT, they call it the MIT disease. The four categories that Dean talked about were um, engineering and innovation. Dyslexics are extremely creative and problem solvers. Um, and because of the 3D spatial reasoning, they can figure out how to build things, engineer things, and make things that a normal brain doesn't think that way. Like uh, Tom Ford, dyslexic, uh, Picasso, Einstein, um, the person who invented the telephone, I believe. Walt Disney, Richard Branson, one of my most inspiring CEOs that I look up to who's dyslexic and that just inspired me. So yeah, engineering, the four categories, engineering and innovation, the arts, uh, Steven Spielberg is dyslexic. Um, being able to see, I think, the whole movie in your head and all the scenes. It's just how the brain works. Uh, architecture and entrepreneurs. I learned that 35% of all entrepreneurs are dyslexic and 40% of self-made millionaires are dyslexic. And when I think about those things, I just wish someone had educated me when I was younger, that these are fields that you can excel in because the traditional model is not made for you because that's not how your mind works. Um, and so that's just something I hope if anyone is watching and you're dyslexic, consider one of these fields, lean into it, explore, know that you're not dumb, you're not stupid. In fact, the third person to walk on the moon, Charles. Conrad, he was dyslexic. He dropped out of high school um, and he, he was wonderful at NASA, genius. Um, he could problem solve in space. <laughs> when something breaks on a ship as you're floating through space, you want a dyslexic with you because a dyslexic will think of the hundred ways to fix it because of the 3D spatial reasoning. It's just, I think it's unparalleled. So I just wish that would have been taught in school and someone would have told me that. And I think I would have had a different perspective on my own intelligence and my own self-esteem and understanding that not everybody fits this cookie cutter mold. It's just not how everyone's brain works.
one out of five people are dyslexic. That's 20% of the population. And it breaks my heart because I saw a statistic that 35% of dyslexics drop out of high school. And they probably never learn about what their minds are meant to do and can do. They only are taught what they can't do. What an amazing message. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> Sorry, unreal. I talk forever. I, I like you, I'm gonna give you, no, literally, like, I feel like we just went to your TED Talk. Like, oh, yeah, welcome to my TED Talk, you guys. <laughs> we don't have to say anything in this interview. Yeah, We're just going to listen to you. You're so that amazing. so powerful, yeah. You know, we have this saying in our videos that the only real disability in life is the inability to see a person as more. And what you're saying really resonates with that. So I grew up with dyslexia. I'm still dyslexic. I don't know if it's one of those things you can grow out of it or not, but I can really relate to feeling as a young person that I was not meant to succeed in school. And the SAT, I had a highest score on math, like 90 something percentile. I had one of the lowest scores when it came to reading. And I remember when I was in a high school English class, I had my English teacher debating with our vice principal about removing me from that class and actually putting me into some special program because I wasn't succeeding. Uh, and now my career is a writer, right? <laughs> so it's amazing as to how you can have these experiences in life where people make you feel like you can't be successful or you have these traumatic experiences, but later in life somehow, you end up proving everyone wrong and you end up in on top like of that field that you were told you can't succeed in. I also have this saying that says, your struggle today is your superpower tomorrow. And you seem like someone who uses your struggles and turns them into superpowers. I also love the part how you were sharing that you grew up without money. I know a lot of people grow up, you know, without money and you now are this massively successful entrepreneur, businesswoman, creative person. Do you think growing up without money somehow helps you become successful? I think it created a lot of the drive, the fire. I remember growing up and my parents were so sweet, so loving, and they gave me all the love that they could give. They couldn't give a lot financially or like material things, but they gave me a lot of love. And there was a few times where if we had had more money, I could see it being more of a shield for my family for some hardships that happened that at the time I was so young, there's nothing I could have done to help out or prevent them. But I saw money as a shield. It could have helped shield, you know, for medical things. Um, I, I think the number one debt in America is medical debt. So it's just so expensive if anyone gets ill or sick. And I see finances as a shield to some things that can be prevented. So I just had this huge drive. I think growing up struggling and not having enough, I think created a drive in me to want to bring myself to a place in life where I could not only take care of myself, but take care of my family and provide a shield that we didn't have when we were growing up. And that's just been my goal, basically, since I was little. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I wanted to do something big that would be able to change my family's trajectory. Yeah. What I love about what you're saying is we have these labels that we place on people and ourselves from the moment we're born. We do that because it makes it easier to put people in boxes. As we get older, we almost have to relabel ourselves as to how we see ourselves rather than the labels people gave us. And I had a lot of dyslexic traits growing up and I had family members who wouldn't let me take the test or get diagnosed as dyslexic because they didn't want to admit their child had dyslexia. So it was, it was even like this other layer <laughs> of how like we don't want people in our society right. knowing that. So then you can't even change it. So I would always be like, yeah. oh, I think I need a bit longer on the exam. But then we hadn't got diagnosed, we didn't do the diagnosis. So I wouldn't get longer on the exam. And then I'd always feel like I was trying to keep up with everyone else. But I had family members who wouldn't allow me. And I saw that happen when I... I later on became a tutor. I would tutor younger kids with math and economics and philosophy and different subjects. And 
when I was teaching some kids with their 11 plus exams that we have in London, I could see kids who had those traits and I would say the same thing to their parents, like, hey, I think you should go take a look because your kid's really smart, but there's certain things that they're struggling with and their parents wouldn't want to do that because they saw that as, and so I love the way that you're relabeling and actually saying, there's all these careers that are amazing for you. There's actually all these things that you're actually going to be more talented at and there's all these things that actually make you more capable right. at doing. And so that relabeling is is so powerful. And you were also, from what I understand, you were also quite shy growing up, but that changed when you studied abroad in China, if, if I'm not mistaken. Like, I, I just want to hear about that that story because I think that's really powerful for people to learn about. Yeah, I was a little shyer growing up. Because now you're like full of was, like energy yeah. and <laughs> confidence and you're on stages and... I was a homebody, yeah. Hung out with my family a lot and... Um, I think something I realized even in high school was I need to step outside my comfort zone because if you stay in your comfort zone, you never grow. So even if you're scared or stressed to try something new, it's really important that you push yourself to do those things because that's how you grow as a person. It's, and it's also how you're going to find out what you love doing. How are you going to know you love surfing, for example, if you don't ever try it? You're too stressed, you're too concerned to try it, you know, or you feel anxiety about trying something new or stepping outside the comfort zone. But what if you try it and you love it? And it's like your favorite hobby in the world. I didn't want to miss out on anything. So in high school, I pushed myself to join theater, which helped me become less shy because you have to speak in public, which was used to terrify me. It used to terrify. I think a lot of people to get public speaking is terrifying. Um, but it became more comfortable and natural. And then in college, I got the opportunity to go teach abroad. And I was terrified. It was a huge leap for me. It was way outside my comfort zone. I had never lived in another country. I didn't at the time speak fluent Chinese. So I was really nervous and I'm going alone. I wasn't going with my family. I wasn't going with my best friends. I went with a program of people, but I didn't know any of them very well. So it was really outside my comfort zone. But having done that, I went, I went through it. I met wonderful people who I still am in touch with today um, at Tsinghua University. It was lovely. I don't not only regret it for a second, I think it really helped me overcome a lot of my, that last bit of shyness that was in me and wanting to hold me back. I think it just went completely out the window because I just let go. I just immerse myself, I just let go, and guess what, everything was fine. It was more than fine, it was great. I had a wonderful time. Um, it was hard, but it was fine. And now I speak very terrible Chinese, so I can, <laughs> I can get by if I'm ever wow. in China and everyone wow. speaks Mandarin, I can get by. Uh, but I w yeah, I wouldn't trade that for the world because I think that that really helped me kick my shyness to the curb. I think that was kind of the last of it. Culturally, it's so different when you travel. You learn so much about how other people do things around the world. And like in China, a staring is publicly acceptable. So <laughs> they, like when you get on a train or something, people too, just <laughs> stare at you. Yeah. And, you know, at first I, I knocked me off guard a little bit. I was like, oh, excuse you. Uh, but but yeah. then it's just culturally acceptable. It's more yeah. normal. Yeah. And then I got used to it. Yeah. So now I didn't know then, but that actually helped me. If I'm ever walking around and someone recognizes me, it doesn't even phase me. It doesn't, I'm just like, oh, well, I lived in China. Everyone stares at everyone. So that, that's normal there. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I definitely think India is the same way. Because when I remember Laura, my wife is a Mexican. You guys, I think, would get along so well, by the way. She's also uh, five foot two, very creative, yes. very bubbly, uh, very family, you know, focused. But when I started bringing her to Indian parties, she'd always come up to me and say, what is wrong with me? Like, is my hair messed up? Is it my makeup? I'm like, no, it's just a cultural thing that we <laughs> like to stare. That's all it is, you know? Uh, so it's funny that you say that. Um, but I, I love how, you know, there's a saying that 
uh, growth is always on the other side of your comfort zone. And it seems like you've constantly put yourself in uncomfortable situations, which I think has propelled your growth so much. And do you feel like if you hadn't done, have you hadn't gone to China, if you hadn't done this theatrical experience, like did that somehow contribute to your success on YouTube or what was your journey into actually being on camera? Yeah, I definitely think it helped because it taught me that when you do go outside your comfort zone, when you do push yourself, that great things can happen. That even though it's scary, at the end of the day, you get to experience all these new things and wonderful things. And I really do think that they shape you and they change you. And it was never easy. So anyone listening who thinks going outside your comfort zone is just so easy, it's not. Mentally, it was a little bit of a struggle. I was really nervous. I, But I think that it if you know that at the end of the day, after the experience, you're going to be so much more rich in knowledge and it, like and growth, it's worth it. It's like investing in yourself. It's just so worth it to do. I do think it really helped. Yeah, absolutely. I think it really, you know, I have a funny story about the theater thing. So we, the high school I was at was doing a musical of Greece. And I wanted to audition for Rizzo, the Italian, because I'm Irish Italian. And I thought, oh, perfect. She's sassy and brunette. And it, this is going to be great. Uh, so I auditioned for Rizzo. And they put up the call sheet on the wall. And I was scared. I had never auditioned for a play before. I was way, I felt out of my league. I had never sang on stage or in front of people. This was all new. And I went up to the call sheet and I'm just like, my heart's beating. And I'm like, okay, did I get Rizzo? And I just looked at Rizzo and I went across and I saw that my name was not there. And I just, again, I just was like, <gasps> Oh, well, that's what I get. I put myself out there and then, you know, I've, I've failed. I went home and I was in bed and I literally was crying. I was just so emotional. And I was like, oh, I, oh, I can't believe this. <laughs> Your life is over. Yes. <laughs> and I got a call from my friend who was like, where are you? Rehearsal starts today. And I go, oh, I... <sighs> You guys, I didn't get it. I didn't get the part. And they go, no, you didn't. You got Sandy. You're the <laughs> main amazing. character. And yeah. I went... <laughs> That's unbelievable. And I really experience. mentally, I <laughs> sold myself short. Wow. Before yeah. I didn't even take the time. I was so laser focused mm. yeah. on this one role, on this one part. I was so late that I couldn't even see. I didn't yeah. even look yeah. at the rest of the list. And I, I learned something from that is to just be more open. Yeah. Um, because I had the time of my life. Yeah. It's such a fun musical. It's so has so much energy. I have made good friends and it really changed me. Um in a lot of ways. It started to build self-confidence for the first time, self-esteem. It's the first time I ever got feedback saying, "Hey, you're good at this. You're good at hitting the marks. You're good at performing. Th this is something you're good at." And I had never really heard that before in school. It was always slow slow, 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 slow reading. Some teachers would even say, I don't get you because you're so active. You're, you know, you're on sports teams, you're in clubs. I see you, but I just don't feel like you're really trying wow. on these writing assignments. And yeah. that was the furthest from the truth. I, I would spend hours and hours trying to write these essays and they just weren't any good. Um, in a traditional sense. Yeah, I always say to people, you'll get to where you want in life, just not in the way you imagined it. And I feel like we have this version of what the path looks like. For you, it was that one line. And when it doesn't look like that, we just get off the path. We just go, okay, well, that's not my path. And you hear that a lot, like, oh, that's not my path, or that's not really the journey I want to take. And I don't think you get to choose the journey, right? You don't get to choose the the path you take always and it always looks different from the one that you end up taking towards where you want to be i wonder it sounds like you've had so many different passions and things that you were interested in and then finally finding people who started to notice good in you talk to us about how that got to cooking i mean you've written two best-selling cookbooks uh you know 
I've seen you bake live on stages and that was the day you were doing the nerdy nummies that day on stage too. And it's like, you know, you have a show on the Food Network. It's like, walk us through how, you know, being Sandy gets to doing food and baking and, and where you are now. Like walk us through that passion discovery journey because I feel a lot of people who are watching this show, whether they're, you know, young adults or, or parents or maybe even if there's kids watching the show, it's like, I feel like a lot of people don't know what they're good at. And most people get told like, you're slow, you're not good, you're, you're not great at that. Like that's what we hear a lot. So how does someone kind of find what they enjoy and what they're passionate about and what they are good at? That's a great question. Try everything. <laughs> that's my advice. Even if you're scared, even if it's outside your comfort zone, try everything because if you don't try it, how will you know if you like it or, or dislike it? And there may be things that you try that you thought you would love and then at the end of the day, you don't love them so much. It isn't enjoyable for you. Or you might try something that seems really scary and you get a little taste of it and it's just amazing. <laughs> um, it's like the best feeling in the world. So my advice is just to try everything. And my passions are kind of all over the place. But what I learned from being Sandy in Greece is I really love the arts. I love performing and I was actually good at it. That was the first time I had heard those words and that resonated with me and that stayed with me. And at the time, I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know, it, well, oh my gosh, am I going to not go to college and I'm going to go try to be on Broadway? I just felt like I couldn't do that to my parents because since I was little, they're like, you're going to college. And my dad sacrificed so much to make it possible for me to go to college um, he sacrificed uh, his own passions uh, to get a stable job to provide for the family. He loved music, and he just kept that as a hobby his whole life because he wanted to be a provider, um, and that was important to him. So they wanted me to go to college, so I'm going. So I was in college, and I'm thinking, okay, what do I do? I'm going to get a degree, and then I'm going to get a good job. Maybe I'm a teacher. Maybe I, I don't know what I am yet, but I'm going to figure it out. And I just kept trying things. I wasn't great at the pre-nursing classes. I wasn't great. There was a lot of things I wasn't very <laughs> great at. Um, I had a lot of jobs. Uh, I was a waitress. I was a dog walker. I worked as a secretary. I worked for a big radio station. I messed up everything. I've never been fired, but I'm surprised I wasn't <laughs> at a lot of places. I would mess up dates and calendar scheduling. I was awful at it. And everyone said I had a good personality and attitude, but I wasn't very good at that reading and writing traditional technical stuff. And it it led to a lot of failures. After college, I just tried every job I could come up with. I tried everything. And it wasn't until I moved to Los Angeles where I started to kind of dip my toe more in entertainment. And again, that's when I got feedback that this is for you. Baking is something that I've done since I was little. It was a um, functional hobby. We had functional hobbies growing up because we didn't have a lot of money. So we could bake, um, cook, garden, sew, clean. There's a lot of hobbies. <laughs> um, so my favorite was baking because my grandma baked. And um, baking was pretty cheap. I mean, the cost of little sugar, flour, and eggs, a little butter is relatively pretty affordable for an activity and it provides food for the family. So at the end of the day, you get yummy cookies to eat for dessert or something. So it was a functional hobby that kind of followed me throughout life while I'm figuring this weird journey out of what's my vocational calling? What am I meant to do? And I would bake for people on set as a thank you. It's kind of my love language in an Italian home, food. Um, I would cook for people I was dating. <laughs> I would uh, cook for family, friends. Uh, and I just kept doing that. So when I started YouTube, I thought, oh, this is, I should do some baking videos. And that was the first time from the YouTube community and online community that they said they loved what I was making. Please make more of that. And I said, okay, let's do it. What do you want to see next week? So every week I would just keep checking in with the community and they were like, we love this. Keep going more and more and more. And it was just so wonderful to hear feedback, people saying they liked 
not only my baking, but me as like a host, as um, like an entertainment host. And I felt like finally the, the, the things that I was good at were finally like melding together and coming together. But my journey to get there was really confusing because in high school, when I was growing up, they didn't even have YouTube. YouTube didn't even exist then. So it, it wasn't even in my mind that I would be creating digital content um, on a YouTube platform or any platform. I It just didn't exist. So I felt like I was kind of this just dough waiting to be like molded <laughs> and here we are now but it's a little confusing how I got here but I felt like kind of things just started to align I would take note a mental note of when I ever got feedback of someone saying you're really good at this and I kept listening to that and waiting for the next opportunity where maybe I could integrate that into something else I'm doing and um, I did a lot of video projects in college, which were not a part of the curriculum. I tried to get out of writing a lot of essays by making videos. I was a YouTuber before I knew it. <laughs> um, I was in a philosophy class and we had to write this huge essay. And I was like, hey, teacher, uh, just, just throwing this out there. Would you be open to <laughs> me making a video presentation <laughs> of what I've learned versus writing an essay. <laughs> and that was the first professor who said yes. Wow, that's yes. impressive. So shout yeah. out to you, you know who you are. Um, <laughs> but it was incredible. That was the first time a teacher had said yes to me. And I put my heart and soul into making this video. And that was really the first video I think I ever made completely on my own. You know, what's really interesting to me is that there's a saying that necessity is the mother of all invention. And I think your life really embodies that. So many people are hung up with what to do with their life, but your skills, they're so profound, but they're so common, right? Like they're things that a lot of people have some skill at, but they may not see as a career. Your story reminds me actually a lot of my wife. So she started by not being able to afford nice clothes in high school. So she started thrifting. And what she would do is she would buy inexpensive clothes and customize them to make them cool by cutting them up, by adding, you know, little buttons or a little flare. And then it was so nice that people at her school started asking her how to get those outfits. So she actually started a business by selling those things to her own friends. And what's so inspiring about stories like Laura's and yours is for those that are wondering what to do with their life or feeling like they may not have certain skills, sometimes it's the most basic skills that a lot of people have that can take you really high places. Uh, so, you know, I love what you're saying. And then there was also a point of your career in which you're experiencing some success. And I believe you had an agent at some point as well. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And then this agent tells you, if you keep doing YouTube, then I'm going to drop you as a client. Yeah. So that's another aspect is how, how when you, not only is it hard to become successful, but when you find something that you want to be successful at, what do you do when you have these people in your ear that are telling you not to do it or that you can't succeed at that point? So frustrating. That point in my life, I was so frustrated. That is the word, frustrated. Just... I went to college, I got the degree, made the parents proud. I've always got that in my back pocket. I knew I could fall on that if I ever needed to when looking for jobs, but I was trying so many jobs at the time and just failing and feeling at the end of the day, even though I wasn't getting fired, you know, everyone's keeping me around. I just felt like the self-esteem was getting lower and lower every day because you go into work every day and you're doing a job where your feedback is that you suck at it every day. And you're doing your job and every day you feel like I suck at this, I suck at this, I suck at this. It just takes a toll. So I finally said, screw it. Uh, my mom gifted me an acting class. I had fun in it. They asked me to volunteer on the largest uh, Star Trek um, fan series that was going on in Seattle at the time wow. called Star Trek Phoenix. Full circle moment. I went to be a PA. I went to go learn about set. I thought maybe I can help out on set. 
Um, I was terrible at coffee orders. I was trying to take people's coffee orders. I got them all wrong. Uh, you know, with a smile on my face, I'm like, here's your coffee. And they're like, thanks, Ro, this is totally wrong. <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> whoops, I'll try better next time. Uh, and uh, one of the actors fell out of the project. I don't remember what happened. I, I honestly couldn't even tell you, but they asked me to stand in and I was like, yes, I would love to. So I got to be a little character in the series and that's when an agent from California, it aired on TV and they said, if you move here, I'll take you as a client. And I said, yes, I'm gonna do it. So I did it, uh, moved to California. Um, I had an agent, a uh, very small boutique agency, and I started to get acting roles. And my career had just started. I had only had like three guest stars. I was just starting. And that's when I also started to do YouTube. I had met Mike. Mike encouraged me. He said, you're so creative. I think, and you're such a personality. I think you'd be great at YouTube. You should really give it a shot. So I started to make YouTube videos, baking videos on the weekends when I wasn't on set or audition. And it was my agent who said, I thought I'm all gravy. Like I thought like, yes, I'm going for it. I'm finally yeah. going to go pursue the things that I've heard so many times that I'm actually good at. I'm going to go pursue that because that makes me feel good. I just remember they called me into their office and they said, you need to pick a side. You either do traditional or new media. You can't do both. If you don't stop doing YouTube videos, we're gonna drop you as a client. And I was so angry, I was frustrated. I just, oh, they couldn't see what I saw. They couldn't see that it's the future. I just, I was so frustrated because there's nothing I could have said or done. I begged with them, I pleaded to just be open-minded about it. I reminded him that the only commercial I had booked that year, it was a big Sony commercial, was because the casting director's daughter was a fan of my YouTube baking wow, videos. Wow. I said, it's an asset, it's a tool, it's helping me, it's helping us. This, this is a wonderful thing. And they were just so short-sighted, I think that they really didn't see what was on the horizon, which is all the production companies are still in existence. They're mm -hmm. still making great TV shows and movies. It's just the thing that's changed is distribution. It's the distribution game is different. And that had been changing since I was in college. I remember in college, I cut my cable, cut the cords, and, and I started to watch TV on uh, ABC, I think, started uploading episodes of uh, Ugly Betty that you could watch for free online. And I thought, this is amazing. What do I need TV for anymore? Um, but now I do it all. <laughs> because all my shows are everywhere. Um, but yeah, my agent definitely didn't at the time have that foresight. And it was just frustrating because you're getting dumped by... Oh, sucks. You just, <laughs> you're getting dumped professionally, but it still feels like you're getting dumped. Yeah. I, it, it is not a great feeling. And it made the decision to go into YouTube full time pretty easy because I was like, well, I'm going to jump in with two feet because I didn't really want to work mm. in traditional without an advocate, like without my agent. Yeah. And it just, it was heartbreaking. It was like the one person who really believed in me in entertainment. And then they're telling you, you're out. One of the hardest parts when I was starting out, I was trying to build a film company on YouTube, essentially, which hadn't really been done before like that. The hardest thing that I had was getting actors because people would be like, what platform is this for? And when I would say Facebook or YouTube, they were just like, oh yeah, we're not interested in any of that stuff. <laughs> and then now it's like, we've got a whole casting department that filters through like thousands of applications. So it's amazing how far it's come even within just a few years that I've been involved in YouTube. And I know your story is similar too, where you had people closing the door on you, right? Yeah, I just, I, I feel like it's really interesting just how much everything that's new will one day become traditional. <laughs> and it's really important to never get into a traditional mindset and always keep a new mindset. Like we're talking about YouTube and one day YouTube will become something that's been around for decades. <laughs> yeah. And 
I think they have enough foresight to know how to keep adapting and keep evolving. But I think a lot of organizations start thinking of themselves as the establishment. And I found that too. Like people always say to me like, oh, if you wanted to help people, like why did you do it on social media? And I was like, because no one traditional gave me a shot. Like when I went to traditional companies and that's what you're referring to, they were all like, you're too old to make it in media or you're too under experienced to make it in media or you're too underqualified to be in media or you're too overqualified to be in media. And so wherever I went, it was like, you're too old, you're too young, you're too, too over experienced, you're too under. And it's like, well, I'm just me actually. <laughs> and the only place you felt welcomed was social media because you got to see who resonated with you without someone needing to give you permission. And I think that's what's so amazing about both your stories as well is that you at one point have to realize that the only person that has to give you permission is you and follow that. And it sounds like that's what you did. And it's amazing because obviously you've achieved so much success in your career and you're living your passion and you've been able to, and we'll talk about serving and supporting your family in that way as well and keeping them close. Which, which is beautiful, but at the same time, I think often what people also think, and we talk about this a lot, is that you made it and now you just made it and life's just great. And, you know, we were reading about how, like, you had a life-threatening bacterial infection in 2019, which is just, you know, three years ago. And I'm like, that kind of stuff really, I mean, I guess, did it put things in a perspective? What did that do for you? And what did you go through? Because I think... Yeah, people forget, especially when you're young and you're starting out and you get involved in a lot of stuff, you forget that we all get older, health starts to deteriorate, things happen, things pop up. Walk me through that a little bit. That event was so bizarre. Um, I was on the set filming a YouTube original with one of my very good friends, Jake Roper, and I came in contact with a really rare form of bacteria. The doctor, when I went to the emergency room, said that it's so rare, I don't ever have to be worried about running into it ever again. It is extremely rare. Um, and they said that it can uh, live on food or even through touch. Um, like if you, you know, touch something on the counter or something and it's, it's that reactive. Um, the symptoms are very similar to meningitis uh, is what they told me, which is fatal um, if you don't treat it quickly. Uh, and it happened on set, and I was so embarrassed because I thought I just had food poisoning. Um, you know, I had just had dinner on set, and then we went to go shoot the scenes, and my stomach was just so upset. And, oh, gosh. And I was like, well, it couldn't have been something I ate because Mike and I ate off the same plate. So I was thinking, well, it had to be then. And I could, it was going through my mind, and I was just confused of why I felt so awful. And then the next day, it just never stopped. You know, I was ill and sick for a day and another day, and it started to affect my vision. I had to have sunglasses on inside with the windows closed. And if any light hit my eye, I would get nauseous and throw up. Um, so we went finally to the emergency room and what was really scary about that is the emergency room, you know, at Cedars is packed. It's full. And when you check, check in triage, they evaluate you, they take your blood, they, and then based on how you're doing, you get a wait time. Um, what was scary is that we came in, it was packed and they took my blood and said, you need to go in immediately. Wow. And that scared me even more. I wasn't happy. I, I was like, oh, no, something's really wrong because they wouldn't be bringing me in in front of all these other people if it wasn't. And it turns out, yeah, it was very similar to meningitis. That's the best way I can explain it. It was a really rare form of bacteria. They had to do a spinal tap. Um, and it was just shocking because... When people say their life flashes be before your eyes, not quite there, but it really had me just take a step back and evaluate what was going on in my life and really start the process of changing some things. And I think once you get bit, get busy, it, you, you have su success, you get busy, you get going, you kind of get on this trajectory, you get in this grind. And it's really good that once you're in the grind, once you're working your buns off and 
doing it all and building it all, it's good sometimes to step back and reevaluate and say, do I need to be saying yes to everything? Is there some times Mm -hmm. where I can do more things for me and have more balance? And that's kind of what that situation did for me. I think that was the first time in my life I had ever said, oh, I'm going to step back just a second. That was really scary. And I don't think I've ever even shared this. I know I I briefly said I was, you know, in the hospital. I've been open about that, but I never talked about how scared I was. And it's just really scary. When everything in medical condition is rare, I think that that's just Mm, scarier because there's not as much information. They aren't treating it as often. It's not commonplace. So I think it it was one of those things that was my first wake up yeah. at this stage in my life, I think, how I would explain it. And then I think losing dad was the second big wake up. Both sad things, but also I think I try to think of the positive and wonderful in the sense that started to help me live a more balanced life. At what point did you lose your dad? Lost my dad a few years ago. He was diagnosed with leukemia. Mm -hmm. And there's two types of like leukemia. Uh, One's longer to develop and one's more aggressive. He had the aggressive, but luckily there was um, a new test drug that was released basically the same year that um, there was trials for it, clinical trials, and he got in right when it started, and it prolonged his life. So instead of getting two years with him, my family got six years with him, which was just a blessing. So grateful because he's such a wonderful, he was such a wonderful guy and a great dad. We were really close. So he actually moved in with me. Um, hit my mom and I, my mom and my dad moved in with me when he was diagnosed, so we could just spend more time together. And that was really one of the most special times in my life because growing up, you know, I didn't get to see my dad very much because he was always working. Some days he worked seven days a week to provide for our family, and so I didn't really get to spend a lot of quality time with him. And even when I was in college and stuff, he was still working. So it was really this time in our life where he was retired, and I had the flexibility with my career to spend a ton of time with him, and I could also help him if he ever needed it financially. Um, he's too stubborn. (laughs) He wouldn't let me help with a lot, but, um, he moved in and we got to spend like six quality years together of just so much quality time. We played Roma Cube every night after dinner. We played board games and I really feel like I got to know him the most in those last six years because of all the time we got to spend together. So I got to know more of his personality and his quirks and, Uh, his sense of humor and his values. And I really got to know more of him in those last six years. So it was so sad and heartbreaking. I'm going to miss him every day, but I'm grateful that we got that time because a lot of people don't get that time. There's so many people out there that are diagnosed and things move so quickly um, or without warning. And you don't get those chances to say goodbye. You don't get that quality time. And I think I'm just really grateful that I got that. Yeah. When there's instances in our lives where we find out that our time is limited with someone we love, then that makes you automatically want to try to spend as much time as you can with that person. But I think what's important to remember is that our time is always limited. And it almost takes these types of stories to help remind us of that. I remember seeing something on Instagram where an interviewer was asking a guest, how old are your parents? And he said, 60 years old. And he said, okay, well, how often do you see them? And he said, "Uh, probably once a year. And then he said, well, if the average life expectancy, you know, is let's say 70 years old, that means you have 10 more times to see your parents. And when you put it in that perspective, your time with them, every time you meet, you're thinking that I only have nine left, eight left, seven left. That time becomes so much more meaningful. And especially as we get to 
a successful place in our lives, we're busy, we're so blindly chasing whatever our goals are, you know, there's a saying that we get so busy making a living that we forget our parents are growing old, right? And I get started with my day and go straight into work that I started doing something in the mornings where if I, if my kids see me, it's one of those things that it ends up taking like 30 minutes of my time or so, because then they're like, daddy, don't leave. Daddy, have breakfast with us, this and that. So I've become kind of clever as to how I can even navigate to my office without them seeing me. And so I thought I was doing pretty good. And then I had the realization like, how big of a fool am I that I think success is not seeing my children in the morning? And so I take a similar mindset where I've realized I would rather accomplish 10% less in my career or whatever it is to make time for those special moments. And so now every morning I say good morning to them. I feed them breakfast. And that just makes me so much happier. And I know it means a lot to them. And my day just seems like so much more better and productive. And I love the fact that you just seem so close to your family. Even your, from what I hear, your mom lives right next to you or is it with us oh with you okay <laughs> yeah and you guys run this business together so what's it like running a business with your family the best <laughs> um i've heard from a bunch of my friends that uh, they don't think they could work with their family and i think that for some people that's true and i think it really depends on your family and your relationships together because sometimes it's a great fit and sometimes it's not um, but her family's always been really close for whatever reason. I don't really know why. I think we've been through a lot together, but we genuinely enjoy each other's company. Um, I kind of mentioned it, but like in high school, I loved Friday nights, TGIF Fridays on TV. You know, they would have all those cute corny family shows on and my mom and I would make popcorn and watch TGIF Friday. <laughs> that was our fun thing to do. And then we'd have a movie night. Oh gosh. I introduced her to Blade and she thought Wesley Snipes was so cute. <laughs> uh, so she's seen a lot of Wesley Snipes movies now, <laughs> but we just, I don't know. We were always really, really close. So working together was almost second nature. Um, when I didn't live with my family, it felt like a limb was missing. It felt like I was missing like an arm or something. I remember I told my sister at her wedding in Seattle, because all my family was in Seattle, and I just told her that I loved her so much. I was so happy for her. Anything that makes her happy, I'm happy. Um, but I missed her. I just missed her like crazy. We were really close. So living in different states was hard. And over the years the more busy I got, I needed more help. It just came down to that. Um, she was flying in every weekend, started off with every other weekend, just to help me with my taxes. They were a mess. She was like, you got it, what are you doing here? You can write all this off. You're not right, this is all equipment. You need to write off your business expenses. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, and she started to step in and help me because uh, she uh, uh, was getting her master's in finance and she worked for Boeing and she worked with huge accounts. She's great with numbers. She's not dyslexic. Uh, she can read really well, write really well. And I, and I just kept, every time she would come into town, I was like, please don't leave. Uh, can you help me send these 10 emails? Because what would take me, you know, it would take me 10 hours to send these 10 emails to process everything, make sure I've written everything correctly. And for her, it's five minutes. She's like, yeah, sure. And I'm like, oh, how do you do this? I, I just find her abilities and skills so amazing. Uh, they're superpowers that I don't have. So I feel like we really complement each other where I'm good with big picture and creative and problem solving. She's really great with organizational skills, analytics. Like she's really good with, she makes Excel sheets for fun. I don't know what that world is like, but that is who she is. <laughs> Seems like my type of person. <laughs> <Sounds like> yeah. <laughs> and it's just awesome because we have this great rapport and balance and love and respect. And once in a while we'll have little tiffs, but they're really not much. They're, we we have a little family tiff, and then we say, sorry, sorry, okay, okay, and we move on. We forgive quickly. We apologize fast. It's just a really 
I never thought about that. You guys, I'm so glad that we're sitting down and talking and having this heart to heart because I don't think I ever would have really realized this. But I think we have a really open and healthy relationship. <laughs> so beautiful. I think that's just what it's always been. And yeah. there's been like weird little patches along the way. But overall, I think um, that's why it works. And that's why I want to continue to make it work. Um, my dad could not manage me, though. <laughs> love my dad. I loved him with ever, every fiber of my being. But um, he was not a good fit to be my manager. <laughs> So that's also what you got to figure out if you ever work with family is sometimes if they aren't good in one role, they're good in a different role. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that was that was one that was not for my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Rosanna, it's such a such a joy talking to you. You're such a you have such a wonderful spirit and such a great energy. And to hear that you've been through so many challenges and difficulties, not just in the beginning, but as life does to you throughout the journey, and for you to still be here today with so much vibrance and positive energy i think is such a beautiful message for everyone who's listening and watching this show because i think they can probably see some of themselves in this journey and think oh i i too can find a way through this and so thank you so much for for sharing so openly so vulnerably with us and i, I want to make sure that we point our audience and community to your direction like what are you working on right now that you're really excited about or what's something that you've been putting together that you'd love to share with our audience that they can check out well there's a new video that comes out every week we haven't missed an episode in 10 years wow. so no breaks no hiatus i'm just a steadfast kind of a gal um just very committed loyal to my community and followers. So if they check in, there's some yummy recipes. Uh, and I'm the most excited about our TV show that's airing right now. I never thought growing up I would have a show on Food Network. I, I would have laughed. I would have <laughs> fell out of this chair laughing if you would have ever told me growing up that I'd be hosting and judging a Food Network television show. That is just... Such a trip for me still. Um, I still feel surreal about it, and I'm having a blast. Mm. Um, so that's airing every Monday night on Food Network. Um, it's also on Discovery and YouTube TV. It's there, and it's just so much fun for me. And I think one of the reasons I really love it and I want people to check it out is it's now the first time in my life that I can shine light on other people's talent. Mm. And that feels really good. Mm. And I didn't know how much I would love it until I did it. Because um, I didn't know if I would miss, you know, baking myself, decorating cookies and cakes and showing off my skills and abilities. I didn't know if I would miss that. Turns out I don't. I love spotlighting other creative, talented people. There's so many talented people in the world Absolutely. that I get a kick out of every episode. We get four new bakers that come on. They get to share their skills and abilities with the world. They're all phenomenal. The, the casting department is incredible. They find the most talented people. And I just feel like it's such a blessing and fun. I get to watch talented people doing their thing and I get to eat cookies for a living. <laughs> so eating cookies for a living is also not a bad <laughs> gig. Um, so I'm just really enjoying that. Yeah. Mm. It's called Halloween Cookie Challenge. I love it. Uh, so those are my YouTube channel and that show are my two um, biggest prides right now. Amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah I can't Thank wait to you. check it out. And I hope whenever we meet next, there's somehow food and cookies involved because yeah. <laughs> you're making me hungry describing yeah. all these things. <laughs> yeah, congratulations, Rosanna, on everything you've got going on. And we're here cheering you on and love sharing your story with our community today. So thank you so much. Thanks for yeah. having me, you guys. Amazing. This was wonderful. Also, side note, I love the little desserts that you gave me before oh, yes. I <laughs> came figured. over here. They, I, you guys, pretty <laughs> good. Pretty good. I'm yeah, really you excited. <laughs> <laughs> you set a high bar. We were kind of nervous, you know, <laughs> like setting up desserts for you. <laughs> they were adorable and so good. Mike ate so much of the that his tongue turned green. <laughs> wow, Mike. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Thank you. It's good to hear. He's like, our producer's name's Mike as well. And he's like, not me. I yeah, didn't yeah, touch yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I love it. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, really appreciate it. This was amazing. So Thank you guys. so much.